This video focuses on an NMR method known as Total Correlation Spectroscopy, or TOXI for short. This is a powerful technique in that one can link all of the nuclei that are connected within a spin system. And so this provides information that can confirm and extend information obtained from two-dimensional proton-proton correlation spectroscopy, or COSY experiments. The textbook describes the three methods presented here. However, as an experimentalist, I generally recommend the 1D TOXI method because we can selectively adjust the mixing time and get a sense of the distance of the protons by increasing the mixing times. 2D toxy and HMQC toxy are powerful methods that give a great deal of information. In some cases, I think it is almost too much information and so I will only briefly mention how to interpret an HMQC toxy spectrum that is presented in the textbook. The disaccharide lactose presents a very good example of how toxy or total correlation spectroscopy can be used to deconvolute an extremely complex proton NMR spectrum. The spectrum is complex not only because there are a large number of resonances between 3.5 and 4.0 ppm, corresponding to hydrogens on carbons bonded to electronegative oxygens. Lactose in solution exists as a mixture of diastereomers. In crystalline form, each diastereomer is stable, but in the aqueous solvent used for NMR spectroscopy, these diastereomers interconvert. I'll digress for a moment to review some reaction chemistry. In aqueous solution, and this includes the deuterated water <clears throat> that is used to dissolve the highly polar carbohydrates. Most carbohydrate hemiacetals undergo stereochemical equilibration. This process passes through an aldehyde intermediate from ring opening of the hemiacetal However, the aldehyde is generated in extremely low concentration. The aldehyde intermediate is inferred by its reaction chemistry. In fact, these are often known as reducing sugars because hydrogenation and other reducing conditions will convert the aldehyde into a primary alcohol. But in the equilibrium, the aldehyde is present in such a low concentration that it is not observable by NMR spectroscopy. So the spectrum becomes much more complicated than what one would expect from a compound with 12 carbons, 14 protons, and this does not count the additional protons on the alcohols which have exchanged with deuterium from D2O solution. Now we get spectra which can have up to 24 different carbon 13 signals and up to 28 different proton signals. Returning to the proton spectrum for lactose, we focus on four resonances that are readily distinguished. And using total correlation spectroscopy, we can then link individual resonances within this complicated and crowded region. 
with the few resonances that are readily distinguished. First of all, I will point out that in solution, the ratio of beta to alpha anomers is approximately 3 to 2 based on the relative integrations. Before proceeding directly to the total correlation spectrum, I recommend taking a look at the carbon-13 and HMQC spectra to prepare for the analysis of the TOXI spectrum. For the proton-decoupled carbon-13 spectrum, although there are a lot of peaks here, we see only 18 carbon-13 resonances even though there is a mixture of two diastereomers, each with 12 carbons. That suggests that six of the carbons in both diastereomers have the same chemical shift and are indistinguishable. And those six carbons may be quite distant from the single chiral center undergoing stereochemical isomerization. The HMQC spectrum also provides some clarity. We can link individual protons that are distinguishable with specific carbon atoms at these four positions. Furthermore, for the primary alcohols, we can link the individual carbons with specific protons. For the most shielded carbons, the two protons of the primary alcohol overlap quite closely. But for the other primary alcohols, there are some differences in proton chemical shifts. This is simply some information gathering that will help us to understand the toxic spectrum when we look at that next. This is the toxic spectrum. It is presented in the same format as the proton-proton cozy experiment. But now we can find all of the protons that are linked together. As I mentioned, there is almost too much information here, but this does show that the most deshielded proton is connected with the six protons in this region, and that's distinct from this proton, for example, that shows correlations with some different protons, some of which are distinguishable from the first group I pointed out. And then one more group of protons that shows that the second most deshielded proton is linked with the most shielded proton. So we can now connect that these two distinguishable protons are in the same spin system. Although this 2D spectrum is still pretty complex, we can look at the one-dimensional toxi spectrum, which is shown here. And what I find particularly valuable is that we can systematically change the mixing time so that we can identify new protons as they come up with increasing distance while remaining within the same spin system. So remember this triplet that is the most shielded proton that we were able to distinguish we can then see as we increase the mixing time that another triplet starts to appear at this position. 
And then there is another multiplet at this position, and then subsequently at this position. But notice that there's hardly any signal at this point until we've increased the mixing time more significantly. And now we're extending all the way from proton one through protons two, three, four, five, and then the two protons that are at the primary alcohol. And in the Toxy spectrum, we can now see that several of these proton resonances are nicely defined as doublet of doublet for both of the primary alcohol hydrogens. These are diastereotopic protons. We can also say with some confidence that B3 is an apparent triplet as well as B2, another apparent triplet. Although the textbook doesn't show this, the same analysis can be repeated for other hydrogens, for instance, from the alpha anomer, also for acetal proton, which end up having exactly the same chemical shift. Although the 1D toxy experiments require multiple experiments and more time used on the instrument, I find that this is probably the clearest way to assign all of the individual protons. And by extension, we can then assign the individual carbons looking back at the HMQC spectrum. The last spectrum that I will show for lactose is the HMQC toxy spectrum. Again, there is a huge amount of information here, but we can tell that for the alpha hemiacetal proton, we can determine the carbon that is connected to it, and then for the other protons, we can find the corresponding carbons that are also connected. Another way to read this is to look at common patterns on the vertical scale. So for the alpha side, we see a pattern of this type. It shows up again in part over here, although there is some overlap with a different section. But it shows up a bit more clearly in this plot. And then we can see it in here and in part over here. That's distinguished then from the beta through here. This pattern has as a unique characteristic the 3.3 .3 peak. So we see that here. Find those carbons. We see that here, 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 and here. The last correlation is probably the most challenging one because we see from this signal, which is the most deshielded carbon, that there are only three other carbons that are correlated. So this represents a limitation. There is a break in the correlation, but perhaps there is no coupling or a very small coupling constant after four carbons. Nonetheless, we can link to this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon, and with the corresponding protons along these lines and these lines. What's also going on then, if there is a break in the correlations, we can find that this, which is a primary alcohol, is correlated with this peak by that type of a pattern. This concludes the discussion of lactose. This is an example 
of another highly functionalized compound. This has a cyclohexane core, which is glycosylated and then contains an amide linkage with electronegative substituents. What we can do is to find one of the acetal protons here, and by irradiating that signal, we can then, with increasing mixing time, identify proton 2, then proton 3, proton 4, and then in order we start to see 5 come up, and finally, at the longer mixing time, both of the primary centers. And that's actually for the group that is shown on the far left of this structure, which is terminated with a primary amine. The textbook shows 2D toxy spectra for a polypeptide compound. Here I will show progressive 1D toxy spectra. So we start out with a fairly complex proton NMR spectrum, but then by selective irradiation of this resonance at 6.8 part per million, which is an NH peak, we can now see that it's correlated with this signal, this signal, and these two doublets, and that corresponds with the alpha proton, which is then connected to an isopropyl secondary carbon, and then we have the diastereotopic methyl groups of the amino acid valine. We can continue working our way with the next deshielded proton. This now focuses on the proton at 5.4 parts per million, and that shows connections with this group of protons, which corresponds with the seven protons of proline. For the next, for the next resonance at 5.1 part per million, we now see correlation here with multiplets around three parts per million and with singlets around 1.6 parts per million. Looking at the spectrum, we can then recognize that 5.1 parts per million corresponds to the alkene hydrogen, the peaks at three parts per million, to methylene groups attached to nitrogen, and the respective E and Z methyl groups. The last 1D toxy spectrum will focus on irradiation of a doublet at 2.9 parts per million. It's this doublet at this position, and it correlates with multiplets in the alkyl region, and then with a couple of methyl groups, which corresponds to the isoleucines. This includes a doublet and a triplet, even though these peaks are overlapping in the NMR spectrum. What's left is the methyl group of the methyl ester, identified as a singlet at 3.9 parts per million, and the aromatic hydrogen of the thiazole at 8 parts per million. There are a few impurities in the spectrum, but otherwise we have accounted for just about everything. This concludes the video on total correlation spectroscopy.